Yo, what's up? This is Essel from the band Dope. We are blowing it up on Capital Chaos TV. You are not. Oh, this is uh, the Iron Serbian of Capital Chaos TV, and we got Edsel Dope from Dope on the phone. How's it going, Edsel? It's good, man. Um, tour just started um, just a couple weeks or two couple days back, and uh, all is good, man. We're just uh, we're in Seattle today. We started off the show in Sacramento, had a great show, had a great show in Portland last night, and um, just starting to get into the swing. A couple more days, everything will feel like autopilot again. And uh, on the tour with you, you have uh, Head PE. Uh, do you have a history with uh, Head PE? You know, we have a history as in we're, we're buddies. We've known, uh, I've known Jared for many years. Uh, great dude. I uh, love the band. Um, but this is the first actual full U.S. tour that we've done with Head PE, uh, which is pretty crazy considering how long we've all been around. Um, in the past, we played a few shows here and there with them, but this is the first time we've done an official tour with them. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, 20 years of dope, where does the time go? Dude, you're telling me. Um, I, I don't know, man. It's it's crazy. Um, I'm, I'm super blessed and super, super grateful that, uh, you know, this thing has has, uh, has been able to keep going. And it, it really is a testament just to, to the hand, you know, the, the band-to-fan relationship that we have because you know how this music business has evolved so much. And, you know, we are definitely not, uh, you know, supported uh you know, by the, the industry. Like, we're not part of a movement. We're not the new kids on the block. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing new and exciting about what we're doing in the eyes of the industry. We're just a veteran band that keeps putting out records and keeps doing shows. And the fact that 20 years later, we still have fans around the world and especially rooted here across America that come out and, and support us and sing all the words, it's, it's, a, it's definitely uh, just a testament to to the connection that we have directly from from band to fan, and I, I'm very grateful for that. Man. It, it's something that you can't fabricate, you can't buy it, you can't you can't uh, can't fake it, man. It, it's a it's a very cool, real, sincere connection, and, uh, and we're very very blessed to have it. And uh, in 20 years, you put out six albums. That's sort of going at your own pace, as opposed to the normal two year grind. Yeah, well, we were we were part of that two year grind for our first several albums, and then I took a break for about six years, where um, you know we can t- continued to play shows here and there, but I wanted to you know sort of reconnect with real life and uh, you know start some other ventures and have a little bit more of a of a home life and spend time with you know family and those things, and then we uh, we dropped another record last year. Uh, we also dropped a live record in between, but studio albums and a live album. Um, but yeah, man, you know, I, uh, I I feel good about that. I feel like we've got, you know, a hundred songs out there. Um, you know, if you're a big fan of the band, you you know, maybe you're familiar with all those albums. If you're new coming in, you know, who has time to listen to a hundred songs? So I feel I feel great about the body of work and the amount of uh, amount of content out there. We're also a very expressive band in the sense that, you know, we may only have six albums, but we've probably got 25 music videos. Um, you know, we've been very aggressive with the multimedia aspect of presenting the band and putting out content that we're very proud of. So, um, so yeah, man, we kind of do things our own way, but I, but I feel like it works. What uh, what was the local scene like in the beginning? Uh, was it 97? Was there a particular local band that inspired you to do it yourself? No, uh, I moved to New York specifically because I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, and uh, I watched how 
process was working for bands in my hometown to get discovered, and it, it kind of didn't make a lot of sense to me. It was a very slow process of attracting the attention of a low-level label person, and then, you know, you'd, you'd showcase for them, and then eventually an A&R person would come see you, and then finally, you know, somebody that actually had the power to sign you might fly down and see you, and, and it's two years later, so me, I really wanted to move to a major city, um, and New York was, you know, it was either New York or L.A., that's where the labels were were, uh, were set up, and New York just felt more my speed. I just really, my plan was to move to New York City and start my own scene and kind of drop a bomb, which is, you know, precisely what we did. Um, we didn't get involved in the in the New York City club scene. They, they were very uh, unwelcoming of us. They wanted us to play on a Tuesday night, you know, at 8 o'clock at night, and I was like, you don't understand. I'm, I'm going to do something special and promote my own events, and, you know, the first show Dope ever played was sold out, lined down the block, because we, we took a very unconventional path to our promotion and to building our fan base. Um, so we, you know, really, for lack of better word, we started our own scene in New York. And uh, it, it was a relatively quick process for us. After five or six shows, we were negotiating with record labels. Within a year, we were signed to Sony, and our, and our debut album came out in 99. So from the inception of the band and the first show that we played, it was less than two years, and we were on major tours and touring, touring the country and, and doing our thing. So very strategic, very methodical, and very much, uh, you know, a, a very DIY approach. At what point did you realize you might be able to make a living doing dope? I mean, I, I feel like I knew it very early on, you know, when we when we first started this thing and started, you know, our, our street marketing promotion in New York and the feedback we were getting from fans. And then, I mean, our first show, like I said, was sold out. We knew then. I mean, we knew when, when you sell out a club in New York, you know, a 500-seater club, and you got a line of kids down the block wearing your T-shirts and, and treating you as if you're a national act, we knew it was not going to take long for the labels to start you know, circling us like sharks with blood in the water. Um, and, and we were right. So, again, it was very methodical. Um, we, we, you know, we're very humble and grateful for what we were able to do, but there was never a, a desperate thought in our mind. We never felt like the record labels were doing us a favor. We really felt like, you know, we, we were building a business and we were building a brand that the labels would be attracted to. And it was their job to just take what we had done in New York City and sort of, uh, you know, duplicate it on a national level. Um, and, and that's really, really what happened for us. As a, as a small business owner, have you noticed uh, a difference over the last, the, over the 20 year time period from administration to administration in the terms of taxes and other business related issues, positive or negative? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, you know, taxes or, 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 you know, those kind of things are, you know, every business has to deal with. I think the, the bigger instance in our case is just the music business itself oh. has gone through so many changes. I mean, our first album came out on cassette. Um, nowadays, does anybody even care about a CD? Um, nowadays, does anybody even buy a, a download anymore? It's all streaming. So... Just being able to survive through the multiple uh, evolutions of the business and the evolutions of how people discover and ultimately how how you monetize music, um, I think that's that's more of um, of the challenge, and that's been more of the of the you know having to be creative and and never being comfortable and stuck in one way of doing things. Um, the major record companies, in my opinion, sort of shot shot themselves in the foot early on by not embracing the digital age, not embracing technology and where it was showing and trying to, you know, rate people out of twenty dollars for, for CDs back in the day when CDs were first invented and um, you know, they had such a gigantic cash cow and it came crashing 
crashing down because they were very greedy. Um, so for us to have survived through that and then to survive leaving the major label and becoming an independent band and then survive the downloading craze and then survive, you know, what is now streaming. I mean, it's really crazy how the revenue streams have, uh, have changed through the years. And, you know, now it's social media, which is much more geared towards a more youthful audience where our band's been around a long time. So our audience isn't super young anymore. So, um, it's also very difficult to prove your value any other way than going on tour and being able to put ass as a seat because, you know, a young band that can, that has far, far fewer fans than an older band like Dope can appear to be more popular because they have more action on social media because they have a younger fan base that participates in social media the same way that our fans participated in magazines back in the day. So it's a very, very crazy uh, crazy business and crazy times and you just really have to adapt and, yeah, you know, I think one thing that's always kept me uh, my head above water and allowed me to succeed is I have a, a crazy strong work that work ethic that was instilled in me from my parents at a very young age and anybody that wants to be in this business it doesn't really matter wh- how the business evolves if, if you don't have a strong work ethic and you're not willing to work harder than the next guy and sacrifice immensely for your love of uh, and your passion of being an artist um probably not the right business for you. Um, oftentimes I'm asked that by young artists, like, you know, what do I do? My number one answer is you really have to believe in yourself and work immensely hard, like tirelessly hard. Um, it's just it's just how it is. Um, so again, I'm grateful for all the things that have allowed the stars to align for me to, to do what I do and, and to have done it now for 20 years. Was 9-11 an inside job and do you have a theory on chemtrails? Well, I don't know if 9-11 was an inside job, but that definitely hit close to home for me being a New York City band. I was standing on my rooftop, and I literally could feel the ground shake and watch the World Trade Center fall with my own eyes, man. It was less than a mile away from my house. Um, it was pretty terrible. Uh, I don't know if it was an inside job. Uh, I really, I'm not the guy to ask. And what was the second question? Do you have a theory on chemtrails? Uh, I don't mean to sound ignorant, but I don't even know what a chemtrail is. No worries, no worries. It, uh, it, it's, it's, it was a silly question anyway. Uh, just one last Fair question, because we got to wrap this up. I know you got more interviews to do. You uh, I have a special limited edition anniversary release coming out uh, in December. Do you want to talk a little bit about what's on that and uh, it's, uh, sure. how, ma- how many copies are available and whatnot? Sure, it's a it's a pretty cool thing, man. I, I uh, there's not a lot of them available. I think I can't tell you the exact number because they haven't even placed the order yet. It's going to be low, though. I mean, it's going to be somewhere in the under five thousand total that we'll make worldwide of those. Um, really, what it is, um, 1997 was when the band was started in New York City. Uh, we got signed to Sony in you know early 98, nine, you know late 98, somewhere in there. The first album came out in 99. So this is basically, the, the, it's, it's telling the story and it's the soundtrack to that early time in 97, 98, before we got our record deal. So it's 20 songs that are all the original demos that were recorded in my bedroom. Um, they're the songs that got us the record deal. They're the songs that were put on cassette tapes and spread around New York City that kids traded around that, you know, helped us get discovered and build our buzz. Um, we remastered them so they can sound as good as they possibly can. But they're really raw. They're super, super um, just, you know, you can really just hear the the, the absolute, you know, infancy of the band and and. We'll, what it was, you know, what it was started out to be. Um, so it's got a real cool sound. Um, it's those 20 early demos, and it's accompanied by a 32-page photo booklet and story booklet where I sat down at my desk and I just kind of told the story of how it all began and how I, I met the different guys in the band and how we played our first show. And it's accompanied by a bunch of never-before-seen photos, and it's really cool. If you're if you're a fan of the band and you kind of want to you know, dig in deep to what really was the absolute foundation and root of the band. Um, 
between listening to those raw early demos and reading through the photo booklet and, and, and you know, reading my words and telling the story and the photos that that uh, that accompany it, um, it's a really cool package that I think people will, will really enjoy and appreciate the time and effort that was spent putting it together. So uh, it's not something that we're putting in stores. It's not even something that I want to put up on iTunes. It's just a physical product that if you're a hardcore fan of the band and you want to pick up, you can buy it directly from us uh, through our website, which is uh, dope the band.com and um, and you know there's there's a couple other cool perks that you know are available with it like we did a recreation of the original show poster from our first show ever in 1998 so just some cool collectible stuff for uh, the, the diehard fans that, that really want a piece of built history like the earliest piece of built history available well, thank you. That's all the time that, w- that was allotted to us. We have more questions to ask you, but we know that you uh, you have more other people to talk to, and we can't just uh, – Yeah, man, I, I do. I got to I gotta jump to another one, but I tell you, I do appreciate you, Zorn, and I appreciate what you guys do. So if you want another couple minutes, if you got a couple questions, I'm happy to you – know, I'll make somebody wait for a couple minutes for you, whatever you want to do. Uh, Oh, with the current administration, are you uh, hopeful or fearful for things to come? Man, you know, I use, I'd like to say I'm a guy that doesn't fear much, but it's a little scary, man. Um, I, there's not a lot of logic at, at, the, at the leadership level of our country right now. It feels like it's very knee-jerk, it's very reactive and emotional, and that's scary, man. When you have somebody leading your country and leading the free world, and, 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 he, and he's reacting to things with emotion and ego, um, that's a dangerous time. Um, I'm, I'm, I'd like to remain optimistic and think that, you know, that you can't really sink the ship, but I mean, let's be real, man. It, it, it is a dangerous time. I, I hope that, uh, that I'm wrong and that everything works out okay, but uh, I think you'd be a fool to not be a little bit nervous with this administration and just the knee-jerk aggressiveness of it and uh, and the, the lack of, of cool head. Um, cool heads usually prevail. I think we've all seen that throughout history, that the cooler heads prevail, and uh, this guy does not have a cool head. Uh, again, I'm, I'm no politician, so I'm, I'm not really here to knock anybody down, um, but it's a little concerning. How important is weed? Um, you know, man, I think it's different strokes for different folks. Um, I think that it, it is very helpful for some people. Um, it's very helpful for some medical conditions. My only fear with weed is is young people finding it at too young of an age and abusing it without understanding the ramifications of what can come with it because some people are affected by it differently and some people, you know, especially if your brain is still developing and you're, you know, you're a young person, like, it it can make you lazy and it can rob you of your ambition and it also can create anxiety and, and enhance things that some people are using it in the attempt to feel better about. Like, some people that suffer from depression and anxiety they will they will turn to marijuana in the hopes that it will help them with those things. And in the beginning, it can. But if you abuse it and you find it at, a, at too young of an age, it can also enhance your anxiety and your depression. So I'm a big supporter of, of legalization of weed, but I feel like it really needs to be – I feel like people really need to be educated on it as well. And I feel like, you know – the biggest problem with our country and all the circle of it is I don't feel like the parents are are parenting kids well enough and educating their kids young well enough and I think that starts with love. I think you have to have a loving, trusting relationship with your child and an unconditionally supportive relationship with your child in order for you to teach them right for wrong and have to actually care about your opinion. Um, so Weed is a very controversial one, and I understand it. And again, I support the legalization of it, but I think that we also could find ourselves in a troubled place if, uh, if the, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to find it for the wrong reasons, and especially the youth, man. Like you 
really I recommend that you don't put anything to, to that that affects your brain, alcohol, drugs, any of that kind of stuff until you're a fully developed human being that has, you know, has some goals and has some, some, uh, some idea of what you want to do with your life because it does have the potential to sort of, you know, take you into other places. And, and, uh, you know, I hate to think that somebody could potentially not discover their full potential because they started down that road too early. That's my biggest advice for young people. Is it's going to be there forever, man. Like patience, patience is a virtue. Like you don't need to have every experience by the time you're 18 years old. Some experiences are better if you wait a little while and let your brain develop fully and sort of, uh, you know, your work ethic and your your uh, your goals and things that you want to do with your life. And then hopefully, if you do get involved in marijuana or alcohol, you can use it to enhance your life as opposed to as a crutch or as as, you know, even something that, that could take away from, from where your life could go. Hope that makes sense. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for your time, and uh, be safe on your, uh, your long everyday tour, right? You're playing every yeah, day right. for six or seven weeks, right? That is correct. That well, thank is you. correct. Well, thank you, and have a great day. Hey, thank you, man. I really appreciate your time. We'll uh, we'll hopefully talk to you soon.